Everybody stand. Y'all ready? Everybody say this together. Ready? These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one. Accept my worship, O oh Lord. Give Lord a hand clap of praise.
is still have the brass band in the back. I didn't say tax band, I said the brass band. Amen. So we can drop off our offering on the way in or on the way out. If you already got it in there, just raise your hand. And if you're going to drop it on the way out, just hold it and put it in your hand. Just hold it up. Look at somebody saying, God's got this. Look at somebody saying, well, let it go. Did y'all get that? Yes. God's got this, then let go. <laughs> All right, ready? I lift my offering to you. Let it please you, O oh Lord. This is my seed. I will at least my hand. It will never leave my life. You will multiply it. Accept my seed, O oh Lord. Go ahead, Brandon. Praise the Lord. Thanks for all the Lord. Prayers. Now, we have a house cooking request you'd like to mention this morning. I'll let the hands special need. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the time and opportunity to be in your house this morning. We just ask that you administer by this. We're gathered here for one by one. Father, be with us in your grace. Father, be with us in the remainder of this service. Prepare our hearts for 
75% of the nation went to church. By 2020, less than 50% of the nation goes to church. If it drops down, one more point, we're no longer a Christian nation. around us. And if we can't see it now, and not only was the, 
uh, church people down to 50 percent but the millennials the greater the greater part of the millennials no longer believe in church they believe in some kind of a spirit something above that they can talk to that's got them and so what's going on is everybody's doing their own thing laodicea means everybody does it their own way so we're right here right now here it is and the Bible talks about generation when the generation died out, the next generation didn't even know what was going on. Well, this generation right here, as this generation begins to go out, I'm telling you, if we don't stand strong and show people and teach them, then it's going to be bad. Amen? Get your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. We will read the first part of that. Revelation, if you don't know where Revelation is, turn to the very last book in your Bible. The very last book in your Bible. Stand for the reading of the word. Next week, this is the last, honestly, for quite some time to come. This is going to be the last, for lack of better terms, soft week for Revelation. This is the last, for lack of better terms again, maybe uh, some of might say the last good week for Revelation because starting next week, literally all hell is going to start breaking loose here. But if you look around us, you see it happening before our very eyes. All hell is breaking loose. Not here if I'm not here to make any political statements. I'm not here to make any of my own personal opinions. I know what the word says. And I know what I see with my own eyes. The good, bad, or ugly, Republican, Democrat, Independent, nobody, you don't believe in anything. If you can't see what's going on here, it's crazy, I think. As a matter of fact, I don't want you to do CPR on me. I don't want you to do anything else on me because if you can't see this, you can't see where my, my heart's at in my chest. Amen. It's right here now. And it's happening. So, so here it is. In Revelation chapter 4. I know I'm sounding pretty tough this morning. But, but uh, uh, I reckon you could say reading this chapter again. Started putting some burrs under my saddle. Because I see it coming. And I see people aren't even trying to even get ready. And it aggravates me. I'm not saying everybody. We're trying. But I see around us there's a lot of people just... It's like the Bible said, in Noah's day, they're going to be married and giving in marriage and we are doing things. Everything's going to be the hunky dory. And then all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is going to come back and go, what happened? What happened? We're in that time right now. Here we go. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard is where a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sword and stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, and sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Let's just stop right there. Father, I love you and I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you, God, for giving us the heads up. I thank you, God, that you showed us so we don't have to be surprised. Whatever happens now in this last generation is so wild. I can't even imagine. I already see what's happening around us right now is already just, just blowing me away. Absolutely blowing me away. And it's going to get worse. So, Lord, help us stay in tune with you. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be forgiven, and we have to know and look for your coming, and everything's going to be okay with us. Lord, I thank you, and I praise your name for everything you do. In the name of Jesus, you pray the church said, amen. amen. You be seated on the way down. Tell somebody the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us, and nothing shall be impossible. Amen. Now, look, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you a little joke, but actually it, it, it leads right into what we're going to talk about today. There was an old Wild West fort about to be attacked. The wily old general sent out sent for his trusty Sioux scout. 
You must use all your 30 years of skill in trying to estimate the sort of army that we're up against here. The trusted scout laid, laid down and put his ear to the ground. Large war party, he said. Maybe 300 braves, four chiefs, two on black stallions, two on white stallions, all have war paint. Many, many guns. Medicine man also with them. Good grief, exclaimed the general. You can tell all that by just listening to the ground? No, replied the Indian. I can see under the gate. <laughs> that was a good one, y'all. You got to say that. I ain't going to find out no way. I'll use that one again somewhere. Amen. All right. Today we're going to look under the gate. Y'all ready to look under the gate? We're getting ready to do that right now. So, so heaven's door, this is the last of heaven's door. Starting next week, the seals begin to open. And as the seals begin to open, it's amazing what's going to happen. And you're seeing it unfold in our very eyes. I believe Jesus right now is holding the scroll and the seals, and he's looking at it. I really believe that. And I believe that it's not going to be long before they start being filled back. Okay? So now, just a little, just a little bit of here, I'm going to show you something. Up until now, uh, there was, uh, as we were reading through the first chapter, there was the glorified Christ. Then there was the seven churches. Then the rapture of the church, which was in uh, verse 1. And then we start getting a glimpse into heaven, and we see God on the throne. That's the center of chapter 4 is the throne. And we see that, that, that God is there, and he's got a rainbow around him, and and the four and twenty elders are around him, representing the New Testament and Old Testament combination of saints and and of uh, those that brought forth the message, and they're in there worshiping him. And then now we get our first glimpse of heaven on the other side. Now I'm talking about on the other side of the rapture. So now we're going to read this. I'm going to put it first. We can read it together. <coughs> Here we go. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like a crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face like a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes were in, and they rest not day or night, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty, which is, or which was, and is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory, get there to turn around there before you can get their X on there. And when the beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him to the center of the throne, which liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, elders fall down before before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created now again we're, we're, we're finishing up chapter 4 next week things really start to get rough and so go ahead and prepare yourself that, that, that and except for on our uh, special occasions and on first Sundays we're going to be going through Revelation. I may have to back up a Sunday or two just so you can get your breath. But it, uh, I can tell you for the Christian it gets exciting. But for the Christian that's not sure or for those that do not know Jesus Christ, uh, it is not going to be pleasant. So, so I need you to listen good. And this is being given out so you can make sure. That's what it's for. So you can make sure that everything's okay between you and God. So you don't have to fear the stuff that's coming. So now we're going to talk about before the throne. So now let's just let's just break this down. I'm not going to get too too in depth with it, but I want to at least get get some things going on. Now before the throne, first that there, there's wonders. Okay, verse five says that there's lightning and thundering and voices. Where was the first time we saw that? Was it on Mount Sinai? Sinai when, when Moses is going up to the mountain to get the commandments and the people were scared to touch God's mountain because of the lightning and the thundering and the voices. Now we see it again. Versus Moses is trying to tell the people what, how God wants them to live. Now John is seeing the same thing because 
God wants John to tell the saints how they should live looking for this day. So first, it's very powerful. Very, very powerful. Starting in the Old Testament, now we got it again in the New Testament. It's God and all his power, all his glory, all his majesty around the throne. Can you imagine hearing that lightning and that thunder and those voices? And here you are, up to this point, John has just been set back and been amazed at all the glory and all the splendor. And now, not just glory and splendor, but now godly fear begins to set in. You can't look at this and not find a fear in your heart for God. There's two kinds of fear. There's the fear of those that aren't saved, which is afraid. There's the fear of those that are saved, which is a reverence. There is a difference. Amen? And so, here's John with his reverence. But not only is it powerful, it actually is prophetic. Because what's going on is, is all hell is getting ready to break loose on earth. And heaven booms in a warning that judgment's on the way. So John already sees the picture of the churches, picture of Jesus, picture of the churches. Now John has a picture of the rapture. And after the rapture, now John is looking around the throne room and he sees the one that sits on the throne. And now he starts seeing this other stuff. And now God is warning him that judgment is getting ready to take place. And so, get ready, as right now, as I start seeing, how many see how much rain we get all at one time? Yesterday we were going down, we live on Slate Stone Drive, a little Slate Stone Road. We were trying to go down Slate Stone Road, and there were several places that the water was that deep across the road. There's people that have gone in the ditch, all kinds of things because of the torrential rain. I told, I told my wife, I said, we don't have rain anymore, we have monsoon season. Just a few weeks ago, they were talking about we were dry. We're not dry anymore. Amen. And I thought about that as I'm talking, thinking about Revelation and thinking about what's coming. And, and just that rain, how does the rain affect us? It knocks out power. You know, uh, 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 our house had without power for a couple of hours this day, all because of the torrential rain. And we think about the way people have, have, have come in and jumped into some of our systems and shut down the power. Uh, fire grids and, <clears throat> and how it shut down gas lines and pipelines and we're not even in this part yet wow can you imagine what it's going to be like when the restricting force of the church is pulled out of the way wow and so, so, so first there's lightning, there's thunder, there's voices then we go a little bit further and as we begin to go a little bit further, now here, this one here is, is, is really, you got to look at this one and look at it with, with, a, with a good mind. Let me get my Bible back up. We're going to have to turn somewhere and we'll read something to you. The witness. First, there's the wonders before the throne. Then there's the witness before the throne. And get your Bible out well, and, and turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 the seven lamps of fire we already know there's seven candlesticks up there. We've seen Jesus amongst the seven candlesticks or the churches and the pastors and all that. But now there are seven lamps of fire. The seven lamps of fire, what, what does it mean? And, and if you look at the theologians can be all over the place, but, and the theology, but if you really look for some very powerful, powerful uh, uh, findings in the Bible, you'll find out the seven lamps of fire is actually the Spirit of God. In its full. Just like the fruit of the Spirit. You see all these fruit uh, love, joy, peace, uh, kindness, uh, uh, patience, long suffering. That's not the fruits of the Spirit, that is the fruit of the Spirit. And all those things were the manifestation of the fruit. The same way, it's not 
this is not seven spirits of God. It's the spirit of God and seven ways that he manifests himself in us. So now, Isaiah chapter 11, that's talking about Jesus here, but because Jesus is going to have the fullness of the spirit with no end. Ready? And there shall come forth a rod out, verse 1, out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That is the seven uh, characteristics of the spirit. And so, so, so remember now, remember, here they are. The spirit of the Lord, the self-existent one. So the first, that is the, it's like the fruit of the spirit. The spirit of the Lord, the self-existent one. One, wisdom. Understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. That's the seven manifestations or the seven characteristics that you see. Uh, Jesus had all those seven. But now, he's no longer a comforter. The Holy Spirit now, up to this point, the Holy Spirit has been an awesome comforter. But now, he's no longer being a comforter because the Christians are in heaven. They're already being comforted. Now, now what he does is he winds up being a different kind of agent now. And the agent he is now is an agent, an instrument of God's judgment. Let's keep on going a little further. See, see the first part of this chapter seemed really pretty cool. Now the second part of this chapter uh, is, is not as cool as the, the first part. Amen. Uh, so let's go a little bit further. The waters. He said there was a sea of glass like crystal around the throne. What did Jesus do? Well, two things that was recorded twice. Jesus walked in on the sea and calmed the water. Calmed the sea. Sea is representative of people. Sea is also in the book of Revelation when Tasha comes out of the sea is representative of people. It's also representative of storms. It's representative of turmoil. And now you see the sea is glass. Pure. No, nothing there. No ripples. Everything is pure, like crystal. There's two things that it represents. Number one, it represents, and it speaks of peace for us. Once you make it to the other side, all turmoil is gone. Wow. Would you like to have, how many ever had a turmoil free day lately? If you raise your hand, I want to take two of whatever you're taking. How many said a turmoil free day lately? No? Either something's going on in your own body, or something's going on in the news, or something's going on around you, or something's going on in your family. And like most of us, we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things, maybe twelve things happening at one time. And so the body really has no time to be turmoil free. But once you get to heaven, the people that actually had died. And they wound up before God and they come back. They said they didn't want to come back because they felt free. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine how it feel like just to feel free and have that pressure gone? But not only is it peace for us, it's his judgment fixed. It's over. It's ready. Judgment is coming. Then, get close to the finish line here. There's the four beasts. Now, now this word beast. Let's turn this back. This word beast actually uh, means zoon or zoon, zoo or zoology. So this word has really not just like beast, like something that, 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 that's out trying to get you, but it means living ones. And so the first one is actually was like a lion, which represents uh, the wild animal life. The second one is like a calf. That represents the domesticated animal life. The third one is like a man. That represents intelligent life. The fourth one is like an eagle. And that represents bird life. So these four birds, in, I mean, for these four beasts, for these four living things, first off, these four beasts represent the entirety of God's creation gathered before. Remember, symbols, there's a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation, very strong symbolic, and it's symbolizing that the whole creation 
is going to gather before God and the whole creation is going to worship him. Uh, I've got another one here. I uh, didn't write it down, didn't put it in here. Uh, the lion also, there's, these are pictures of Jesus. Did you know that? They're pictures of Jesus and they're pictures of the gospel. The lion pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the gospel of Matthew. The lion of the tribe of Judah. As a lion, he possesses his majesty, power, and authority. The calf represents Jesus as he's portrayed in the gospel of Mark, a suffering servant. As a servant, Jesus demonstrated service and strength. The man pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the gospel of Luke, the son of man. As a son of man, Jesus possesses perfect intelligence, absolute moral righteousness. And the eagle pictures Jesus as he's portrayed in the gospel of John, the son of God come down from heaven. As the son of God, he possesses majesty and transcendence. These beasts are so much like him because they are so often with him. Let's talk a little bit more about these beasts. The Bible says that these beasts are full of eyes. What does it mean, full of eyes? Perfect intelligence. Not only intelligence, but perfect now, not only have, have a perfect vision, not only physically, but they've got a perfect vision spiritually and mentally. They are awakened to what God is doing. The next is six wings. Six wings speaks of swiftness. You know, I heard him talking about Purdue. Purdue tried to make it, or tried to come up with an easier way to, to, to make uh, chicken legs because they were sold so good. So I heard him going to God tell me, he said, you know, Purdue uh, had invented a six-legged chicken. I said, how good is it? He says, I don't know, they ain't been able to catch it. <laughs> okay. See, I know. <laughs> Six wings speak of swiftness. And then it says they rest not. It speaks of ceaseless activity. So this is going on. We already have it going on, but now this is when you get in the book of Revelation. And this is what's going to be taking place while as the seals are being opened and as hell is released a little bit at a time, but by the time the seals are released, that's by the time now all hell is broken. Okay, so, so this actually represents all the creation. And all the creation is going to stand in the presence of God. They're going to lift their voice to praise to the Creator. Remember, He's the Creator. He is the Creator, and everything that is made exists for Him. And for his glory. Now I'm going to do this one more time, one more bit, and then we're going to, and then we're going to come up and pray. I want y'all guys to get ready. Watch this. The praise in heaven. Let me get my Bible again. I want, I want to, want to. You can't miss this. We sometimes have a problem praising God. Have you ever had a problem praising God? Have you ever said I just don't feel like praising God? Every just said, you know what? I'd rather do anything than praise God. But you know what you need to be doing when you don't feel like praising God? It's praising God. That's right. So, so let's watch this now. And when this beast give glory and honor and thanks to him that sit on the throne, who liveth forever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, sit on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. So first, let's look up at this praise. First, it's voluntary. Amen? If God's got to beat you up, push you in it, and pull the praise out of you, that's not true praise. It's not praise. If, if, if my wife has to say, come on, say something good to me. Come on, tell me how, no, look, look, look. Tell me I'm looking good. Tell me I'm acting good, or tell me I've done some good cooking. If, I, if, I, if she has to tell me to tell her, guess what? How I many appreciate when you got to tell somebody? Well, how, how good a job do you think I did? <laughs> Not good, is it? You know, well, you know, uh, I, I like the guys at the Paul Funeral Home. They, you ain't got to ask them, they'll tell you. I remember I was doing the funeral one time. 
And Raymond, y'all remember Raymond? Ra Raymond, uh, he sat back here in the back and one, one Sunday you said, oh, we're having a big service and he said, now I know you get nervous in a big crowd. I said, yeah, I do, Raymond. He said, so I'm gonna help you out. I said, how are you gonna help me out? He said, I'm gonna be right back there. And I said, if you get nervous, forget where you're at, or just don't think you can handle it, I just want you to do this. I'll come up and take over the service for you. I said, just do this. He said, just do that. That's my signal. I said, okay. So as we're going through the service, I remembered what he said. As I look back at Raymond low end. <laughs> and all of a sudden I heard squeak, 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 squeak. Those doors, he walked out the door and the doors were, were squeaking. Then when they came to the graveside, we had a really, really, really tough funeral. You know, some were just really harder than others. And if you know they were with Christ and they've lived a good life, you know, it was a celebration. But, if, you know, if it hadn't been, it's not always so, so uh, welcome. And he come to me and said, well, David, he said, I want to commend you. I wasn't even looking for any praise. I said, really, Raymond, what do you want to tell me? He said, well, he said, uh, that's, he said, I have heard better. He said, but that weren't the worst I ever heard. And when you're at the bottom, there's no way to lift it up. I said, you're just such a bundle of encouragement, Raymond. All right. If you have, God has to pull it out of you. It's not, it's not praise. It's not. You praise him because you want to. These beasts, they're in heaven. They don't have anything else to worry about. They're voluntarily worshiping God. And the 420 elders, they fall down before God. So not only is it voluntary, it's visible. Because they fall down before him and worship him and they cast their crowns, that their, 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 their crowns, their victory crowns, they cast them before God at his feet. Not only is it visible, but it's vocal. And being vocal, and they're saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. But I have created all things and for thy pleasure. They are and were created. Wow. How long has it been since somebody, especially your children and your family, heard you praise God? Sometimes they hear you use God's name in another way. I hope not, but maybe so. They've heard you praise Him. Wow. And then valuable. Because the Bible says they took those crowns and they cast them at His feet. That song is my desire. I love it. Because it says, you can have your earthly fame. That's not what I'm looking for. It's my desire to be with him, to be like him. Wow. Starting next week, it's going to get different. And so today, I want everybody to stand. So today we're going to do something. You know, I think about what we saw just in the throne room. And it is a sight to behold. First, we saw power. Not only do we see power, but we see passion. But also, we see preparation. Before the storm hit, God shows the preparation. Next week it begins. Every head bowed right now, every eye closed. <clears throat> when I read the book of Revelation, it used to scare the pure snot out of me. Because I couldn't understand it. I was a little fella. Didn't make sense. And all I could think of is, am I ready for what's going to come down? 
now when I read it, I get excited because I see what's coming down the pike. But not only get excited, I also get concerned for the ones that aren't ready. And I know there's people in my own family that aren't ready. At least they haven't exhibited the fruit. And they tell me, they tell me, I don't want anything to happen right now because if I died, I don't know where I'd go. And I try to tell them, try to show them, and they just shut up. It also concerns me for those that have no idea what's going on. Because the era that we live in, the events that are going around us, they're trying to shut God out. And by shutting God out, the Antichrist can rise up
judgment without showing us how to go beyond or get from it or stand away from it or keep it away from us. You always show, whenever you show the sickness, you always show the cure. And I thank you for the cure right now. And I thank you, God, that needs are being met all over this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for having me looking good. <laughs> Guess what?